All right, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're plugging in from. My name is Rebecca Thistlethwaite. I'm the director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. If you're not familiar with our organization, we are a cooperative extension community of practice for small and niche meat processors, producers, and their associated supply chain. And we provide education and technical assistance for that sector. Um, today, we're bringing you a webinar about halal certification for meat processors. And I'm really excited to have a couple expert speakers to discuss this with you and then um, take your questions at the end. So the way our webinars work is that we uh, have about a half an hour of content and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for Q&A. You can pop your questions into the chat box or the Q&A box and I will facilitate those questions and then we'll wrap up before the end of the hour. Um, so this topic um, has been something that uh, I've been receiving a lot of phone calls about over the last few years, especially uh, with meat processors thinking about adding halal um, or new halal processors getting started and not really understanding what the certification process entails. Um, halal certified food is expected to reach nearly two trillion in sales in 2024. Um, but there's a lot of different certification entities with different standards uh, that are operating across the country, as well as other parts of the world. And so it can be a little bit confusing to understand uh, what the process is. So we've got two experts of the well-respected nonprofit Halal Monitoring Services, which is a project of the Sharia Board of America. And I'm going to stop sharing my slides so that we can share their slides. Mohammed, you want to load up your slides now? Yes, Rebecca, can you all see the slides? Yep, looks great. Um, so our first speaker today is Mufti Mohammed Abrul Haq. Uh, I think I got that right. Um, who is a senior lecturer at Darululum, Chicago, which is an Islamic seminary where students become Islamic scholars, and the assistant to the National Director of Halal Monitoring Services of the Sharia Board of America. He has extensive educational and teaching background spanning over the past 25 years and over three continents. And our second speaker is Mohammed Khan, who is a volunteer inspector in Halal Monitoring Services with a background in information technology and management consulting. Mr. Mohammed Khan has experience in community outreach, inspection, and monitoring strategy and training. So I'm thrilled to have these two gentlemen with us today and they're gonna take it away. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, thanks Rebecca for the introduction. Uh, so the first portion of our um, presentation uh, is an introduction on HMS and really what, what halal really entails. And I'm gonna humbly request uh, Mufti Muhammad Abrarul Haq to uh, walk us through the first uh, few slides, if that's okay. Hi, thank you. I'm Muhammad Abrarul Haq. Uh, I'm the assistant director of HMS, which is uh, halal monitoring services, which is a project of uh, Sharia Board of America. Sharia Board of America was established in 1998. And the purpose is to uh, serve the community uh, so that they can live their life according to the faith and uh, also uh, values of Islam. Uh, Rahmat Alam Foundation, which is the umbrella organization, uh, the headquarter is in Chicago, and we have branches in 23 states. Uh, the work of uh, HMS uh, is ex expanding day by day. Um, we certify and monitor uh, over 240 entities, which includes slaughterhouses, processors, 
distributors, uh, meat shops, restaurants, and uh, many other entities. Uh, we also work uh, in other countries like Canada uh, as well. One of the uh, you know main characteristics which distinguishes HMS from other certifying bodies is that we work free of cost for the benefit of the community. So basically, we don't charge any money, and we don't take uh, we we don't. Uh, uh, demand any money from the slaughterhouses or processors or restaurants, etc., uh, because we are a non-profit organization. Um, I, I will talk about uh, the, the requirements in a minute. So what is HMS? HMS is organization to ensure that the, the meat or the poultry or other food uh, products which are consumed, uh, they're uh, prepared and processed according to the principles and, and values of the faith. So HMS basically um, verifies and certifies the uh, the products, uh, but also monitors on a regular basis. And when we say monitor, uh, we mean uh, unannounced, uh, you know, visits, unannounced inspections, and you know, uh, random uh, visits. The the people in the background are basically religious scholars. Uh, who have wealth of knowledge uh, about the uh, principles of faith. Uh, and then on the ground, we have uh, people who are directors. Uh, we have volunteers. We have uh, people who monitor on a regular basis. HMS does not only certify, uh, for example, a restaurant or a meat shop as such, HMS certifies the whole supply chain. So right from the slaughterhouse through the, uh, the people in between, uh, the people who supply and the people who, uh, who sell the final product to the, to the consumer. So it is end-to-end -end certification and end-to-end -end monitoring. I think this can uh, help you understand. So we su supply, slaughter, we uh, certify and monitor slaughterhouse, and then we certify and monitor processors and distributors and restaurants and retailers as well. And all of that is free of cost. Yeah, I think. So basically we, we are working in 23 states and uh, we have uh, slaughterhouses, processes, and distributors, and some of the some of the entities and some of the brands which you might be familiar with are these. Yeah. Okay. Just to make it simple, when we say halal, because there is a lot of confusion. Uh, both among the Muslim population and also in the wider industry about the meaning of halal. The, the literal meaning of the word halal means permissible. But there are certain animals that are permissible to be consumed and certain animals that are not permissible to be consumed. But even a, per, uh, a bird or an animal which is permissible to be consumed it is only permissible to be consumed when it is slaughtered in a specific uh, manner. So these are the requirements uh, to make it uh, halal and consumable. So the person who is uh, slaughtering an animal, it ha has to be a Muslim. So for example, a machine cut uh, cannot be considered halal because a machine cannot be called 
uh, or classified as being uh, Muslim because it, it's not a human being as such. Um, our certification only um, works with the uh, Sunni uh, Sunni branch of Islam uh, as such. Now the person who is slaughtering has to say and has to take the name of God for each animal or for each bird individually. It cannot be that a person has taken the name of God at the beginning of the day and then for the rest of the day the process is blessed. It, is, it doesn't work like that. Every single uh, animal or every single bird uh, has to have the blessing of the name of God. And we do interview the slaughtermen and we do train them so that we make sure that they understand the requirement and that they, they, they do it well. When we say slaughter, the, 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 the bird has to be slaughtered, what we mean by that is the four winds, uh, arteries and passageways they they all have to be cut the the bird has to be given some time so that the blood can come out uh, so the further processing cannot start immediately we have to give some time so that the the blood comes out of the body yes i think we can move to the next slide Yeah, I, I will leave it uh, to um, Brother Khan, uh, Muhammad Khan, who is a volunteer and who is also an inspector at uh, HMS. He can take you through the process of uh, application and uh, what it entails. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Muhammad Abdullah Sahab. Um, <clears throat> just to add, one point to what Mufti uh, Muhammad Abrar mentioned. In, in faith, the, uh, the teachings are rooted in a sculpture, which is Quran and Hadith. Hadith is the sayings of uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, what HMS does is its standards are closest um, to Quran and Hadith. We don't serve away from the teachings just because of demand or industry needs or supply and demand needs. Uh, that's not how uh, the faith works. That's not how our standards work. So all of our standards, they're according to Quran and Hadith to ensure um, a faith-based matter is handled uh, using the teachings of the faith instead of uh, industry requirements and so forth. So uh, having said that, the certification process for slaughterhouses and processors is pretty straightforward. Uh, there aren't extremely stringent or complex requirements. Uh, what we have done is we have taken a very high level explanation of the requirements and documented uh, as part of this, uh, this presentation. However, there is a detailed uh, process which is available on, on the website uh, and there are terms and conditions for different types of businesses such as slaughterhouses and processors who are getting certified. So further details can be reviewed as part of the actual application process. Here we have tried to explain it at, high level, at, a, at a high level. So for a slaughterhouse or any other entity which is getting certified, they have to fill out and submit an application. Um, now, if it is a slaughterhouse, say uh, a, a very small size, mid-size uh, poultry slaughterhouse, let's say they do 3000 chickens a day. Usually for a small operation, there is one main slaughter person and one backup that has to be available on standby, as we say it. Uh, but depending upon the volume, if 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 someone is doing forty thousand, there is a plant in 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 down up in New York, they do around fifty thousand chickens a day. So then the requirements 
uh, of the number of slaughtermen becomes higher based on the volume. So we have seven to eight slaughtermen um, in that plant on a daily basis, uh, revolving uh, between them, they do the slaughter. So one of the requirements is to have a um, decent number of slaughtermen available at the facility all the time. Uh, bigger animals, I'm going to give an example. There is a uh, plant in Toronto who does, uh, who does produce uh, a really significant big and big number of uh, beef, boneless beef, big volume of boneless beef. There we have four to five slaughtermen to do around 400 to 500 heads a day. So depending upon the production volume, we adjust and we expect the plants to uh, incorporate that particular number of uh, the, the, the main step, the main step where the Islamic scholars and our other inspectors who are visiting the slaughterhouse, um, they verify the steps of the halal slaughter that Mufti Muhammad Abrar al Haq mentioned in his uh, part of the presentation. Uh, those steps, as Mufti Sahab included, uh, explained, is the person has to be a, a Muslim, uh, a Sunni Muslim. They recite the tasmiya at the time of slaughter. They uh, do it individually. That is one tasmiya or one blessing is not enough for the entire herd of animals they're slaughtering. So every life they're taking, they have to take uh, the name of God on it. And then we also observe and verify if all the required veins, arteries, and passageways are, are, are severed. On the, the, the fulfillment of those requirements and verification of those requirements is when a report is submitted to the, to the body of the scholars. They perform a review of the application and the inspection report and then they make a favorable decision if everything, uh, everything is, is uh, according to the standards. Uh, there is a step, and as an example, it did happen recently in a plant in Jersey, in New Jersey, where it was a chicken, uh, a chicken plant, uh, a poultry slaughter plant, and the individuals who were slaughtering, they did not, um, fulfill all the requirements properly as part of the first inspection. So there was a um, training session incorporated for the, the slaughtermen where the scholars, uh, as we call muftis, they again visited the plant, they performed a, a training for them to explain to them the exact requirements and how to implement those requirements. And then there was a follow-up inspection after the slaughtermen were trained everything was verified uh, for fulfillment of the requirements and then the process was uh, completed. And I know we are, we are talking about a lot of details and just in a few minutes, we will move to our uh, Q&A session where we will be able to address any and all of, hopefully all of your questions. Now, <clears throat> so, uh, in addition to certifying slaughterhouses and, and processors, as, as Mufti uh, Muhammad Abrar mentioned, uh, when it comes to certifying further processors, and we consider further processors as someone who uh, products which are either ready to cook or partially cooked or just further processed like hot dogs and gyros and so forth. So not only the meat has to be procured, meat or poultry, let's say, has to be procured from one of our certified and monitored facilities, but the further process processor has to also ensure that there are stringent and strict cleaning and segregation procedures are uh, implemented in the plant to ensure there is no there is no contamination of halal with non halal and we we understand that majority of the usda facilities or 
all of the USD facilities have to follow uh, a very stringent code for segregation as well as cleaning. So it, it does really help if the plants are USD certified, but from a religious and faith standpoint as well, uh, we verify and make it a, as a very important part of our further processor um, uh, certification. Now, the very, very important, a very, very important part um, that Mufti Muhammad Abrar touched upon is the monitoring. Really, uh, the certification itself, the very first time when we inspect a plant, uh, usually it takes one to two visits, uh, and that's pretty much it for certifying the plant. But the real, real process, uh, real important process starts once the certification has been issued. And upon issuance, we announce it to the general public through our social media and our websites, and we issue a proper certificate that the establishment is supposed to uh, display in the front offices or on their website and so forth. But the monitoring is where we, on an ongoing basis, verify if the plant is um, fulfilling the requirements on the basis of which they were certified in the first place. Um, so unannounced inspections and unannounced periodic inspections is something that is incorporated as part of the monitoring strategy that is really uh, needed for everyone. But then there's a combination of other uh, resources which are utilized for uh, assisting with the monitoring. Because given the fact that we have close to 70 slaughterhouses and processes right now, which is not uh, huge, however, given the nature of our organization and the resources available, we can't have inspectors uh, visit these plants all the time, or we can't post inspectors in these establishments. Um, so we have to incorporate other resources, utilize other re resources and incorporate other strategies in order to monitor. So some of those monitoring strategies include uh, a weekly schedule or monthly schedule sharing. So for August, we received some of the schedules from the plans this week and we'll be receiving in next week and a half. So the schedule just really means on an ongoing basis um, that the plant is operating five days a week. The slaughter starts at 6 a.m. and it ends at 2 p.m., for example. Um, that's as simple as it as it is. Then there is in some of the plants, depending upon the need, because some plants do halal and non-halal both, and we do have certain plants. We don't prefer those plants, but we do certify such plants where halal and non-halal is taking place. The reason why I'm, I said we do not prefer such plants is it makes uh, things a little more difficult and complex. Whereas if the plant is entirely certified, then it becomes easier for us to monitor and, and, and so forth. Um, but nothing against any such plants, we are open to certifying and monitoring. So depending upon the need, there might be a weekly report uh, for which we provide a template for each um, facility, each establishment where they provide updates regarding, say, the number of heads which were slaughtered, uh, who was the main slaughterman, who were the backup slaughtermen, um, has there been any change to the process, any significant changes. They report the slaughterhouses uh, and processors, they report that on a weekly basis in some cases. Um, because we don't want a slaughterman to be removed and replaced with a new slaughterman without our knowledge, because that's really the main uh, main main place where all the requirements would either be fulfilled or they will be missed. So that's something also that becomes part of the weekly report. Uh, sometimes we do periodic video conferences with the team of slaughtermen and 
the QA or operations individuals in the slaughterhouses to just check in with them and, and see if they have any issues or if we have ongoing questions, we just chat with the with the slaughterman this way. Um, in addition, the for the further processors um, for each production run, we request a report. Again, this is a template we provide to uh, the processors to fill out, where they provide the sales, the usage of any ingredients, and the final production uh, weightages and so forth. And again, just just to stop and and mention, we don't implement any of these strategies just for the sake of it. Uh, this I'm mentioning to ensure that everyone understands uh, whoever represents a uh, an organization or a slaughterhouse here or a processor, let's say. Uh, this is not to scare anyone away or tell them that, hey, we have so much documentation that we have to provide. The documentation is as needed as uh, uh, on an as needed basis. So plants where everything is halal, for example, where there are three slaughtermen all the time available, they're doing all the slaughtering every week, then it makes our life easier. We may not need a weekly report from that particular plan, or we may need a monthly report. So all of the monitoring strategies other than the unannounced periodic uh, in-person inspections is in order to ensure that the requirements are being fulfilled on an ongoing basis. Uh, so that's pretty much the conclusion of uh, the explanation of our um, who we are, what halal really entails, what halal slaughter means, and how our process works. This is pretty much what we had uh, planned upon uh, from a presentation standpoint. And I would send it back over to uh, Rebecca. All right. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, while folks are thinking of questions to pop into the chat or Q&A box, uh, I've got a few. Um, the slaughtermen that you hire who have to be Sunni Muslim, do you help uh, the plant find those slaughtermen or is it up to the plant to reach out to their local uh, Muslim community and try to identify uh, one of these trained individuals? That's a really, really good question. Uh, Rebecca, we do help. Although we don't have a bench where people are available. So, and again, the, these requirements, they come from all over the place. For example, we were helping someone in Big Cabin, Oklahoma mm -hmm. recently. It took us six months to, um, and it's unfortunate, I know. The closest Muslim community was in um, Tulsa or Dallas. Mm -hmm. And it took us almost five to six months to arrange someone. And unfortunately, we were not able to. Uh, the plant was trying itself, going to the Islamic centers around um, Big Cabin, which are not many. Yeah. And we were also trying. But during COVID, labor has been a huge issue as well. But in a nutshell, we do try to help. Yeah, because I know a lot of plants are located really rurally and not near any Muslim communities. Like I knew a facility in Kansas that was thinking about adding halal, you know, maybe one day a week or something. And the nearest community was like three hours away. Um, and so they, I, I imagine if they found somebody, then they would also have to pay for them to travel, maybe stay overnight in a tiny town of 300 where I don't even think there's a hotel, right? Um, mm. So I know sometimes plants really struggle with that aspect of it is just finding the slaughtermen in their region. Um, so you you can help to some extent, but it's it's not always gonna work out, right? Right, well, that makes sense. Um, there's a few questions that have come in, so I'll, I'll just start uh, asking you them. Uh, Susan says, thank you for doing this presentation. Am I correct in my understanding that in halal meats, there are no other requirements insofar as the care, raising, husbandry, rations, handling, et cetera? Um, 
I, I think that that is not the case, but Muhammad or Mufti, you want to explain that? Yeah, <clears throat> I think, you know, um, there, there, there are general guidelines in terms of how animals they should be taken care of, how animals should be looked after, um, all the way up to the point of uh, slaughtering. So it is not the case that there is nothing to be done uh, except only when the animals are being slaughtered. Uh, in fact, there are there are guidelines how animals should be looked after. And so does your certification go all the way back to the farm if somebody wants to certify their meat as halal and, and sell it as such? Uh, no, the, the uh, certification does not include that part. Okay, so it's it's just like best practices, but it, it yes. doesn't mean you necessarily go back to the farm. I know in the, I think Muhammad told me that in the case of poultry, um, they have to be vegetarian fed, right? That's one of the key requirements. And then what, yes. about, what about for ruminants? I imagine they just have to be fed you know, vegetarian as well, because they're ruminants, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, next question from Giddin. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, if you don't charge the slaughterhouses or any of the other establishments you certify, how do you raise the funds you need to provide your services? Uh, well, we are a nonprofit organization and we do take donations from the public. And we we encourage uh, you know people, and we actively uh, raise funds because the services are for the benefit of the community. So we do ask the the community to donate, and they, they do, do donate. So the services are covered by donations. That's amazing. So basically for the slaughterhouse, their only expense is paying the slaughterman, right? Yes. Yeah. But they don't have to pay for the certification. No. And one thing, uh, Rebecca, I'm uh, yeah. so sorry, just to interject and uh, clarify. So when it comes to the fees or cost of the certification, it's zero dollars. Uh, and like Mufti Sahab mentioned, uh, we, we, this, this work was started back in 1998 as part of the Sharia board when it was established. There are other services as well. Uh, and until 2020, even the travel expenses were not being asked for by, by the HMS. So majority of, uh, majority if not all the travel expense, which is not a cost of certification, I, I believe everyone understands that. There is no cost of our certification, but starting in 2022, 2020, the uh, organization's leadership requested, started requesting the slaughterhouses and the processors to pick up the bill for our flight if we have to fly somewhere, for example, and, and we have to stay a night or take a rental car. So that's really reimbursement of the expense we are making to visit a particular establishment. However, just to put it out there, it's not a requirement if someone does not reimburse us, that's fine. The organization is still, um, it's a very hard job to raise funds, but the organization is still, uh, every year we have plans during the month of Ramadan. Uh, a lot of the people are traveling and they go out request for different types of donation from the general community. So as to remove the burden from the businesses. Uh, therefore, there is no monthly, yearly, per pound, per endorsement, but a sticker, no fees or costs uh, at all for our certification. That's amazing. Um, Giddin also asked another interesting question. She said, if the slaughtermen are not employed by you, how do you know that their allegiance is to you and the standards that you uphold? Um, you, you want to take Yeah, uh, well, basically, the the slaughtermen they are interviewed uh, to make sure that they 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 believe in what they say, 
and also they are known to the local community. It is not like they are from, from the middle, middle of nowhere. They will have local connections and they are uh, sort of vetted by the local mosques and local community as well. Uh, so uh, once we we once we have satisfied with the requirements of the slaughtermen, then we don't have any reason uh, to doubt. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that makes sense. And then just to add to what Mufti uh, Muhammad Abraj said, as part of the monitoring strategy uh, explained earlier, we remain in touch with the, the slaughtermen on an ongoing basis. And as it is all faith-based, when a person knows um, we are not questioning them because we are making money from them or we have, we have no stake in their financially, then people do understand that, hey, they are doing this for religious purposes. And the people who are slaughtering, majority of the slaughtermen we have always met, they're very good practicing uh, Muslims. And then they're doing this job because they know it's a very noble work because when they will slaughter, the, let's say 500 lambs a week or 2,500 lambs a week, they know a thousands of people are gonna go consume it as halal. So they also have a sense of responsibility, which we not only through interviews verify it, but we on an ongoing basis uh, continue to, to verify it as part of the monitoring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Um, Seku asked, in the case with new plants, how, in, how far in advance would you like to be made aware that one is being built? We are in the early stages of building a new halal plant here in central Virginia. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can, I can take this. Uh, Rebecca, it, it, it all depends. So the facility, once it is ready for, say it's a USDA uh, uh, facility, it would be nice to know ahead of time. We know that there are a couple plants uh, being built right now in Texas for beef. Um, uh, but knowing, just knowing that a plant is being built doesn't really do anything, but it's good to know ahead of time. However, once the USDA approval comes, we should know about the USDA approval uh, expectation about a month in advance. So we can start the paperwork um, and by the time the USDA approval happens and the first slaughter takes place, we not only have the paperwork uh, in line and submitted and quote unquote approved from a paper, paperwork standpoint, but we also know an estimated first day of slaughter. Because usually what bigger processors do they do everything in, adv in advance and they make sure we are there um, in person on the first day of the slaughter. So they can have the highest possibility of receiving the certificate as soon as possible and they can sell the product under our certification. Is there any aspect of the plant design? I mean, especially the kill floor, um, the... Um... What do you call it? Now I'm spacing facing out. facing the Mecca. Yeah, is there any aspect of that design that's that needs to be considered um, before it all gets built and installed? Well, Mufti Sam, um, I'll request you to please answer. Yeah, uh, I think you know the, the way the slaughterhouses are are designed. Uh, so it, it varies because normally the slaughterhouses they're, they're designed for uh, for machine killing so it, it is it is worth visiting some of the plants where the birds are being hand slaughtered so that they can actually figure out uh, what is the best practice rather than you know uh, doing it ourselves well also That's... for red meat like the knock box design and the head head gate and stuff like that um, needs to be all considered um, if you're going to do halal, right? Can you help provide some advice or consultation to plants that are thinking about adding it for red meat? Um, I think we, we can certainly, um, you know, we can certainly uh, connect them with some of the existing plants 
and they, they, they will be you know, happy to share the, the best practice and, and advice. Great. Yeah. Um, do you have anything else to say about that, Mohammed or Mufti? I, I was just gonna, yeah, I was just gonna add, um, when it comes to some of the requirements like facing the, uh, the Mecca, for example, the animal should face uh, Mecca, the animal should be fed water right before the slaughter, the animals should not see each other while being slaughtered. All of these other requirements that we have not mentioned is because they're not um, they're not compulsory or mandatory. They're really, really good to have. And we do um, advise and, and, and guide the plant owners and plant managers to follow as much as possible of those requirements as well. But say an animal was not facing Mecca was, when they were slaughtered, we are still going to call it halal. The halalness, quote unquote, will not be affected by the other requirements. I think that was one of the uh, angles of that question. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just add, you know, this, this is also connected to the previous question, which was asked about uh, animals being fed with uh, a vegetarian only, you know, etc. So there are, there is in terms of the religious, uh, there, there are certain requirements which are must and compulsory, then there are recommendations, there are strong recommendations and there are like, you know, things which are good to have. So th 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 that varies from, from, from case to case and from situation to situation. Uh, what, what we have mentioned only the bare minimum requirements for something to be halal. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um... One gentleman here, Mark, um, says that uh, he runs an online uh, marketplace in kind of the Midwest area, and he's looking to, to find some halal meat for his marketplace. Um, do you guys have a directory or um, any sort of list of halal meat processors or producers um, that he could look into or do you have any recommendations there? Uh, yep, we, we have the website. Um, either you can visit, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we should have put a link somewhere. If not, we will share it as um, um, after the fact, if possible, through Rebecca. The, the web, there are two websites we currently have, the shariaboard.org slash certified dash listings. Uh, that's where all the list of the current certified restaurants, meat shops, processors is available. In the processor section, you can go and select the dropdown uh, to go to a specific state, uh, processors in a specific state or country. Uh, that way you can take a look, uh, same as www.hmsusa.org. And in addition, our email address that we had shared um, uh, as part of the process of submission of the application, that same email address you guys can use to reach out to us for any questions um, moving forward regarding such uh, such areas. It, it is really helpful when we are able to connect businesses together uh, from a supply and demand standpoint. It helps us make our supply chain stronger. That's great. Could you maybe pop those in the chat box if you'd be willing to? Just type them yeah. in there. I, I can do that. Perfect. Um, let's see. One gentleman asked any services for disabled vet veterans. Um, not exactly sure what he means there, but your services are already free. Um, so I don't know what else beyond that you could do. Um, and then another person asked about recording. Yes, I forgot to mention this video is being recorded and we will post it to the NPAN YouTube channel. If you don't know this, uh, NPAN has a channel with over 70 videos from webinars and uh, interviewing processors, um, lots of great content on there. So definitely check that out. It's just a uh, niche meat processor assistance network at YouTube. 
Um, all right, any other questions from the audience? Let's see. He popped in the chat box, the certified listings, and then as well as their email, if you wanna reach out to them. Um, I guess my, I did have one last question. If a processor is thinking about adding halal and gonna pay a halal slaughterman or two, you know, a lot of the folks we work with are pretty small plants, so maybe they'd only need one or two people, but what can they generally expect to pay um, that person, you know, are there sort of going rates for that? I mean, I mean what we see, Rebecca, is, is 18 to 22 hour, 22 per hour, and in some some areas where, uh, you, you know how the labor market is right now. Uh, we have seen 33 per hour, 30 per hour as well in the recent, uh, recent times. We keep people who are experienced to, can do work with the speed and uh, skill. So we have seen it serving between 18 and 33 currently. Yeah. But it's again, it's all subjective. It all depends on the location and people, the demand and so forth. 18 to 22 an hour and then plus probably covering travel time, right? Yep. Um, I guess apparently our chat is disabled, sorry about that. So I popped the um, contact info and here it is again. Um, so thank you for showing that. Any last questions before we close a little early? Um, let's see, yeah, Anonymous asks, as far as producers, where would they need to go to research halal animal husbandry practices? It's a good question. Any thoughts there, Mohammed or Mufti? If, if, if they have any specific questions, they can they can email them to us, and we'll be happy to uh, guide them and help them. Okay, great. Thank you for being so so flexible. Uh, and that email is right here, right? Yep. Okay. Because like, like, like Mufti Muhammad Abrar said, it, there are so many uh, technicalities that get involved when we're calling something halal and non-halal based on other requirements. The ones that we have mentioned, those are the bare minimum. Then there are other things that can affect um, the process of certification one way or the other. So for those detailed questions, we are very, we're going to be very, very happy. Uh, we request everyone to be open and ask questions through email. Mm -hmm. And one or more of our team members will take care of you guys. Because that's the, the cause of this organization. Uh, just to, as a closing remark, the cause of this organization is to help the community get true and proper halal. Because of the commercialization of halal, there are so many different versions going around where these bare minimum requirements are not being uh, met. Mm -hmm. So then the organization's goal and aim is to ensure that proper halal can get to the stomachs of those who really want proper halal. And they're paying a really uh, premium price for it. So they should not be cheated out of their faith and requirements should actually be met. And one of the biggest reasons why our leadership for these 20 plus years, they have never even thought of charging money is because of the conflict of interest that comes with it. So mm -hmm. we're gonna be more than happy to help anyone with any questions they may have for any of the steps of the procedure or further clarifications on what halal really means and what you can do to become halal certified. Awesome, thank you. Well, I'm really happy that um, we made contact with you and that you are sharing your resources with the community and you know, uh, making your services available for free is fantastic. So thank you all for being here and for your time. And I hope you have a lovely day.